Chapter 11 of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Mayor's Conscience. In the spring of 1920, Blake suddenly received orders to proceed to a town in the south of Ireland on special duty, and on applying for leave was granted a fortnight which he determined to spend in Dublin. In due course his relief arrived, and after handing over, he found himself free from all responsibility for the first time for many months. At this period the government and the Irish railwaymen were enacting a comic opera worthy of Gilbert and Sullivan at their best, the government paying the railway companies a huge subsidy, the greater part of which found its way into the railwaymen's pockets in the form of enormous wages, while the men refused to carry any armed forces of the crown and the public, who of course indirectly paid the subsidy, looked on helplessly. In order to get a passenger train, Blake had to motor thirty-two miles to a station in the next county, where as yet no armed forces had tried to travel. While waiting here, a green country boy asked him some trivial questions, and with little difficulty Blake led him on to tell his whole history. In spite of a Sinn Féin edict to the contrary, many young men, who could find no work in Ireland, or who wished to avoid service in the IRA, were at this time contriving to emigrate to the States by crossing to England and sailing from Southampton. In order to defeat this, Sinn Féin agents were in the habit of frequenting the terminal at Dublin for the purpose of getting in touch with these would-be immigrants and forcing them to return home this youth who came from the ballyrick district and had never been in a train in his life told blake that a brother in the states had sent him his passage and that he was due to sail from southampton in a few days time but had to go to the american consul in dublin in order that his passport might be visaed and asked blake where the consul's office was Blake warned him not to tell anyone he met on his journey that he was going to America, or he would surely fall into the hands of the Sinn Féin police, and thought no more about the matter. When the train reached a junction after about an hour and a half's run, there was considerable delay while a large party of auxiliary cadets searched the train, and eventually arrested a police sergeant whom they removed after a desperate struggle to a waiting motor. Blake was reading at the time and did not think anything was wrong until he saw the sergeant being dragged out of the station. It then occurred to him that, though he thought he knew every cadet in the West by sight, yet he failed to recognize any of the search party. However, it was useless to interfere, as he was alone and unarmed. Blake stayed at a hotel near Stevens Green, and for the first part of the night so silent and empty were the streets that Dublin might have been a city of the dead. However, about 2 a.m., a miniature battle broke out in some near quarter, and for hours rifle fire and the explosions of bombs continued, varied at times by bursts of machine-gun fire. The following morning, after breakfast, he set out to see a high official in the castle, a friend of his father's, and also to report at the IRC headquarters there. While walking along Grafton Street, shots suddenly rang out at each end, and at once the crowd tried to escape down several by-streets, only to be held up by the cadets at every point, and it was not until two hours afterwards, when the cadets had satisfied themselves that the men they wanted were not there, that Blake was free to proceed to the castle. The streets appeared much the same as usual, but the castle was greatly changed from peace times. The entrance gates were heavily barred, barbed wire, steel shutters, and sandbags in evidence everywhere. Outside, a strong party of Dublin Metropolitan Police and Military Foot Police. Inside, a strong guard of infantry in steel helmets, while a tank and two armored cars were standing by, ready to go into action. As nobody was allowed to enter the castle without a pass, Blake had to get a friend from the headquarters of the IRC to identify him before he could gain admission, and he learnt from his friend that the party of auxiliaries he had seen the previous day arresting the police sergeant at the junction were in reality a flying column of volunteers who had managed to smuggle the cadets' uniforms into the country from England. Blake found that most of the officials in the castle were virtually prisoners there, and in order to keep their figures down had improvised a gravel tennis court and also a squash racket court. 
when training at the depot in dublin blake had made the acquaintance of a colonel mahoney who had retired and lived near kingston with his only daughter and his chief object in going to dublin was to see miss mahoney again after leaving the castle he met her by appointment and after they had lunched and been to a picture house they left by tram to be back in time for tea with the colonel after the tram started blake found that he had an hour to spare and got out at ballsbridge to see a friend while miss mahoney went on alone on reaching the mahoney's house blake learnt that when miss mahoney got out at kingstown she had been followed by four young men who had demanded the name of the man she had travelled in the train with and on her refusing to disclose blake's name they had knocked her down with the butts of their revolvers and left her there partially stunned the following day when on her way to meet blake again in dublin her tram was held up by auxiliaries and all the men on it carefully searched for arms but before the cadets boarded the tram miss mahoney saw several young men pass their revolvers to girls sitting next to them with the result that the auxiliaries found no arms on leaving the tram at the end of kildare street the pockets of her coat feeling unusually heavy she put her hands into them and found a revolver in each at the same moment two men overtook her and demanded their arms when he had been in dublin four days blake had to go to broadstone station to inquire about a kit bag which had been lost on the journey to dublin he reached the station about a quarter of an hour before the departure of the train for the west and passing a group of young men on the platform recognized amongst them the youth who had asked him where to find the american consul there were no police within sight, and it was useless to interfere single-handed, but without doubt the talkative youth had fallen into the hands of the Sinn Féin police, who were returning him to his home, minus his passage money. The group consisted of four dejected-looking youths and three rough-looking men, obviously in charge of the others. When his leave was up, Blake left for the south by an express train, changing at a junction about two hours' run here just as the train was on the point of starting an armed party of the royal fencibles under a subaltern marched onto the platform and took their seats in several different third-class carriages the officer getting into blake's carriage there was a considerable delay and blake expected that as usual the guard and driver would refuse to carry armed soldiers but to his surprise the train started without any incident after an hour's run the train pulled up with a sudden jerk in a cutting just outside a station and as the subaltern put his head out of the window to ascertain the cause the train was raked from end to end by heavy rifle fire and the young subaltern collapsed on top of blake his head shattered by a dum-dum bullet blake threw himself flat on the floor of the carriage until the fire from the top of the cutting slackened owing to a lewis gun opening fire from one of the carriages near the engine taking the dead boy's revolver he then jumped on to the line and made his way towards the forward carriages where the soldiers had opened fire with their rifles here he found a gallant lewis gunner badly wounded in an arm and leg firing his gun as fast as he could mount the magazines and so preventing the volunteers from leaving their cover at the top of the bank and attacking at close quarters so hot was the lewis gunner's fire that after five minutes the volunteers broke off the action and simply vanished blake then turned his attention to the wounded civilians and though he had grown indifferent to dreadful sights through years of war the awful condition of the dead and wounded in that train made him physically sick the majority of the wounds were from flat-nosed bullets with the most terrible results in one carriage lay a young woman in a pool of blood her chest literally blown away by one of these devilish bullets in another a middle-aged man was screaming like a mad wild animal his arm and shoulder shattered and at his feet lay an old countrywoman the top of her head blown off very few of the soldiers had been wounded and under blake's command they at once started off in pursuit only to catch a glimpse of the volunteers disappearing down a road on bicycles after a long delay the train went on and in order to try and forget the awful scenes he had just witnessed blake endeavoured to read two english papers the first paper in a long leading article called for a policy of conciliation in ireland while the second a threepenny edition of the first recounted at great length a speech made the previous day by a famous legal politician 
calling loudly upon the government to withdraw all troops from ireland and demanding that the r.i.c and auxiliary cadets should be severely dealt with for their brutal reprisals on innocent people but never a word about the savage attacks on these same r.i.c and cadets by these uh, innocent people or a single thought for the widows and orphans of the murdered policemen in disgust he threw both papers out of the carriage windows and consigned all politicians to the bottomless pit on arriving at esker blake found that his chief duty was to act as liaison officer between the military and police and that he would be attached to the staff of the g o c of the district he quickly realized that the bad reports of the state of the south had not been exaggerated and that it was in a far worse state than the west ambushes of police and military attacks on trains shootings of unarmed soldiers and police in the streets at all hours of the day and night the finding of dead men riddled with bullets in every kind of place from an open field to an empty house and the robbery of mails occurred daily with monotonous regularity and so accustomed had people of all classes become to this saturnalia of crime that they thought no more about the murder of a human being than the usual man thinks of killing a rat blake's principal work consisted of investigating these crimes in company with police and soldiers and afterwards in making out a report for the general in addition he accompanied the general when making tours through the district one morning they received news of a terrible ambush of cadets and on arriving at the scene of the ambush blake found the dead bodies of the cadets still lying on the road all their equipment and personal effects had been stolen and their faces smashed in with an axe probably in several cases this barbarous mutilation had been committed before the unfortunate cadets were dead two days afterwards the bodies of the murdered cadets passed through esker en route for england all shops were closed and great crowds collected in the streets blake was greatly struck by the different attitudes of sections of the crowd some taking their hats off with every mark of reverence and sympathy when the coffins passed while others kept their hats on until ordered by the officers to uncover and many showed plainly by their faces that they were in full sympathy with the murderers conditions in the south were now rapidly drifting into a war of extermination and every morning brought fresh reports of men shot the previous night either in bed before the eyes of their relations or else against a wall outside their homes one evening word came to headquarters through the secret service that a baker in an outlying village was to be shot that night it appeared that the baker a moderate Sinn feiner had been chosen by the inner circle to take part in one of their nightly executions and had refused so the edict had gone forth that if the baker would not commit murder he would be murdered himself the general at once sent blake with a party of soldiers to try and save the baker's life but missing their way in the dark they arrived a few minutes too late they found the unfortunate man lying on his bed shot through the head while the only account of the house the murdered man's sister sat white-faced by the bedside moaning and wringing her hands they could get nothing out of the sister except that a party of armed and masked men in trench coats as ever had suddenly burst into the house and insisted that her brother should accompany them for some unknown purpose and that he had refused for a time they argued with him until another man rushed into the house calling out to them to be quick as the soldiers were near whereupon they shot the baker as he lay in bed with the sister looking on and then left the house hurriedly there seemed nothing to be done and blake was on the point of leaving when his eye caught a piece of white paper under the bed which turned out to be the baker's death warrant for treason signed by the c m a of the i r a on his return blake handed the death warrant to the intelligence people who returned it shortly saying that they could make nothing of it after showing it to the general blake put the warrant away and thought no more about it some weeks afterwards owing to the shooting of soldiers and police in the streets after dark the curfew was advanced an hour as a result the number of curfew prisoners greatly increased so much so on the first night that there was no room in the usual detention quarters and the officer of the guard was obliged to use an empty office for the overflow while the general was working in his office after dinner the officer of the guard brought a note from the mayor of the town 
who he explained had been found on the streets after curfew hour by a patrol and was now a prisoner in the office below the note requested a personal interview with the goc and stated that the matter was of the highest importance the general passed the note to blake who was puzzled by the familiarity of the writing but unable to remember where he had seen it before after some hesitation the general decided to see the mayor who was brought in by the officer of the guard and left alone with the general and blake after beating about the bush for some time the mayor asked that he might be kept under arrest and if possible deported by sea to england as he was in great danger of assassination but would give no reason for the danger only stating that he had received threatening letters the general explained that under no circumstances would he allow the mayor to be detained under arrest or deported unless he could show sufficient reasons the mayor replied that he considered the threatening letters an ample justification for his request he had not brought the letters with him but that if allowed to go home with a guard he would fetch them but the general being determined to get all the information he could out of the man and knowing that once he had granted his request it would be impossible to get anything out of him refused by now blake had identified the mayor's handwriting with the writing on the baker's death warrant and getting out the latter placed the two papers in front of the general who at once taxed the mayor with being the head of the inner circle in esker this he denied but on being confronted with the two papers broke down and made a complete confession it appeared that for a long time past he had been the leader of sinn fein in the district and though himself a moderate man he had been unable to control the wild men who had forced him as head of the inner circle to sign the death warrants of the men condemned to be executed or in other words the men they wished out of the way after a time being a very religious man his conscience had rebelled against wholesale murder and he had refused to sign any more death warrants whereupon the wild men being afraid that the mayor might give them away had signed his death warrant themselves and that very morning he had received by post a warning to prepare for death the general was now quite satisfied to order his arrest and deportation forthwith but the mayor asked that he should be allowed to go home to say good-bye to his family and that he might be arrested in his own house at some early hour in the morning it was now nearly midnight and the general after granting his request arranged that a patrol should arrest him at four a m at four a m to the minute blake drove up to the mayor's house in a lorry with an officer and fifteen men but at once saw that something was wrong instead of the house being in complete darkness most of the windows were lit up and the loud wails of women could be heard in an upstairs room leaving the officer to post sentries at the front and back of the house blake knocked at the door which was opened after some delay by a woman who on seeing a police officer tried to slam the door in his face blake however managed to slip into the hall and asked the woman what was wrong but she ran upstairs calling out to some one above that the police had returned on the first landing the woman was joined by another woman and a man and after a lot of trouble blake at last got out of them that an hour previously a party of tall men in black mackintoshes with soft hats pulled over their eyes had gained admittance to the house and made their way straight to the mayor's bedroom where they found him kneeling down by his bed praying after pushing the mayor's wife out of the room they shot him threw his body on the bed and rushed out of the house blake asked to be shown the mayor's body and the man led him to a bedroom at the back and opened the door after making certain that the dead man was the mayor blake left and drove straight back to the general that day the town was seething with excitement and it was openly stated by many men that the mayor had been murdered by the police shortly afterwards a public inquiry was held and it was clearly proved that every policeman in the town could be satisfactorily accounted for during the night of the murder and moreover that every round of rifle and revolver ammunition could also be accounted for however this did not suit the sinn feiners and a verdict of guilty was brought in against the authorities though there can be no possible doubt in any unbiased mind that the mayor of esker was murdered either by or by the orders of the inner circle when he went home after his interview with the goc the natural assumption was that he had been giving information and the inner circle determined that he should give no more
Whether they knew that he was to be arrested and deported at 4 a.m. and deliberately forestalled the arrest, or whether they merely knew that he was at headquarters and were waiting to murder him on the first favorable opportunity, is not clear and does not affect the question of the guilt of the murder. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 A Brutal Murder. The childlike trust which so many Englishmen have in their institutions is a source of never ending wonder to Irishmen, more especially the Englishman's blind faith in the integrity of the post office in both countries long after sinn fein had made the irish post office its chief source of information the government and public continued happily and blindly to confide their confidential correspondence to the tender mercy of the king's enemies and at the same time express their bewildered astonishment at the uncanny amount of information that the sinn fein secret service was able to obtain it is highly doubtful if blake would ever have even thought of obtaining information from the mail-bags if a young subaltern who commanded a platoon of the blankshires temporarily stationed in the ballybor police barracks had not made the suggestion one night at dinner and had even offered to carry out the operation himself if blake had any official qualms at first blake refused knowing that the authorities did not approve of tampering with the public's private letters but being desperately hard up for certain information he gave in and it was arranged that jones the subaltern should carry out the search a cross-country letter in the west of ireland will often take nowadays any time from three to five days to arrive at a town only twenty miles away and of the chief reasons of this delay one is that the mails often lie for twelve to twenty-four hours in a head post office before being sent out to rural sub-offices for distribution or in a railway van at some junction awaiting a connection this was well known to blake who had often to complain of delay in delivery of official letters and also of letters from the castle being frequently opened in the post examining the mails in the ballybor post office was out of the question owing to the almost unbelievable fact that the staff from the postmaster to the charwoman who washed out the tiled floors of the post office every morning were sinn feiners one and all so that there only remained to search the mails in the train at this period the western railways were slowly dying from a creeping paralysis caused by the engine drivers and guards refusing to carry the armed forces of the crown quite oblivious of the fact that it was only possible to pay the railway men's enormous wages through the government subsidy for a time some lines shut down but a goods train managed to reach ballybor six days a week with mails and the bare necessities of life for the inhabitants chiefly porter barrels by good luck the guard on this train chanced to be a loyalist probably the only one on the line and it was arranged with him that the mail should be searched by jones while the mail van waited on a siding for several hours at a junction about sixteen miles from ballybor disguised as harvest men jones and his servant were dropped at night from a crossley close to the junction and admitted to the mail van by the guard they at once set to work with electric torches the batman opening the letters whilst jones read and made a note of any useful information and when they had finished returned in the car to ballybor barracks on returning to the barracks blake and jones went carefully through the information and found that one letter addressed to a noted sinn feiner mr pat hegarty who lived near a village called lismore about eight miles away gave sufficient evidence on which to hang mr hegarty the writer stated that on the third instant hegarty was to expect the arrival of an officer of the i r a in uniform who would come from the direction of castleport in a bicycle about ten p m hegarty was to keep this officer in his house place the new supply of american arms at his disposal for ambushes and the officer would not leave the district until blake had been either killed or kidnapped 
Some months previous to this, Blake had been in the South on special duty, and during his absence, McNaught, the D.I., who relieved him temporarily, had called a truce with the volunteers as long as all appeared well on paper, with the result that the volunteers had been able to make full preparations for a second effort to wipe out the police in the district. Soon after his return to Ballybor, Blake heard strong rumors of a second landing of American arms during his absence, this time at night at Ballybor Quay, and the letter confirmed the rumors. On the night mentioned in the letter, Blake and Jones, accompanied by a police sergeant and two constables, left Ballybor Barracks in a car after dark in the opposite direction to that in which the village of Leesmore lay, and after going about three miles turned off at a by-road and proceeded by unfrequented roads until they reached a small wood about half a mile from Hegarty's house on the Castleport Road. Here they blocked the road with the car and waited for their victim there was bright starlight and punctually at nine forty five they saw a cyclist approaching from the direction of castleport but so dark was it in the woods that the cyclist only avoided running into the car by throwing himself off to be quickly seized by two stalwart policemen before he could let go of his handlebars gagged and well tied up then they took him into the wood removed his uniform dressed him in an old police uniform, and finally deposited him at the bottom of the car. Jones then put on the volunteer officer's uniform, took his bicycle, and rode on to Hegarty's house, while the police backed the car up a Boharine and waited there. Before starting out, they had arranged that Jones should camouflage his English voice by a Yankee twang, as a brogue was quite beyond his powers. On arriving at Hegarty's house, Jones leant his bicycle against the wall and gave three mysterious knocks at the door. For quite two minutes there was no answer, and just as he was preparing to knock again, the door opened about three inches, and a girl's voice asked in a whisper who was there and what he wanted at that time of night. Now, unfortunately, the letter had not given the name of the IRA officer, so Jones, being afraid to give a name lest the Hegartys might know the officer's real name, muttered that he was a Republican officer and had come to see Pat Hegarty. The door at once closed, and he could hear the girl open and close a door at the back of the house, and for fully ten minutes nothing further occurred. This was not part of the play, which Jones and Blake had carefully rehearsed in the barracks that afternoon, and Jones was quite nonplussed what to do next. Being young and impetuous, he was just on the point of ruining the whole show by breaking in the door, when it opened and the girl's voice told him to come in. The room was pitch dark, and for a second Jones hesitated, but the girl laid her hand on his sleeve and led him through to a lighted room at the back, where he found Hegarty with his wife and son about to sit down to supper. Hegarty bade him welcome, and the meal started. After they had eaten for some time in silence, Hegarty asked him several questions about where he had been recently, and of prominent volunteers in other parts of the country. Jones made the best answer he could, not forgetting to keep up his American accent, and mentioned casually that he had only recently come over from the States, where his parents had been living for some years. For a time there was silence again, but Jones could feel that the eyes of Maria Haggerty were on him all the time, and presently she began to ask most awkward questions about places and people in the States, and Jones was hard put to it to avoid suspicion luckily maria mentioned that her friends lived in the eastern states so that it was easy for jones people to live far away in the west and the situation was saved supper over the women cleared the table and retired while higgerty produced a large jar of poteen and tumblers and the three men settled themselves round the fire to drink and talk for the next two hours jones extracted all the information he could out of the haggertys who though shy at first warmed up after several glasses of poteen and jones learnt from young haggerty that the arms were kept under the floors of a disused protestant schoolhouse in the rectory grounds at cunala the rector of which was a notorious loyalist and would have died sooner than conceal arms knowingly for the rebels at this point jones who had never tasted poteen before suddenly realized that he was nearly drunk and that before he became quite drunk it would be wiser to lie down on a bed 
On inquiry he found that he was to sleep with young Hegarty, the idea of which so staggered him that he felt soberer at once and determined to try and hold out. Suddenly there came a violent knocking at the front door, followed by what sounded like the bang of a rifle butt on the back door. At once the Hegartys put out the light and started to hustle Jones up a ladder to a loft above the kitchen. But by now the poteen had quite got to Jones's head, and when the police went into the kitchen, they found old Hegarty and his son still struggling to get an IRA officer up the ladder. The Hegartys now let go of Jones, who promptly closed with Blake, and a tremendous struggle started in the kitchen. In a few minutes Jones was overcome and lay on the floor with a heavy constable sitting on his chest. Blake then ordered the Hegartys to light the lamp and afterwards to stand against the wall with their hands over their heads and the constable to take Jones outside and shoot him. But he had not reckoned on Maria, who burst into the kitchen and with piercing screams endeavored to throw her arms around Jones's neck. Maria was a strong girl and desperate, and it took Jones and the two constables all they knew to shake her off and struggle out of the house. Luckily, Maria did not attempt to leave the house, and ten seconds after the back door had closed, six revolver shots rang out in quick succession, followed by the sound of a heavy body falling on wet ground. After telling Maria and her mother to go to their bedroom, Blake took Hegarty and his son into the back yard and showed them the body of the unfortunate volunteer officer thrown by the police on the manure heap. During the next half hour he had little difficulty in getting all the information he required about local volunteers, he made no mention of the arms, and after warning them not to move the corpse, the police left the house. Maria appears to have been greatly taken with Jones's youthful beauty and nearly ruined the whole show again by insisting on her father and brother going out to bring in the corpse and lay it out in the kitchen. Luckily the Hegartys were too much afraid, and Jones told Blake afterwards that the agony of lying with his face buried in liquid manure was nothing to the agony he suffered listening to the Hegartys arguing whether his corpse should be left lying on the manure heap to be eaten by dogs or brought into the kitchen and laid out as a decent son of old Ireland should be. While this argument was still raging, a car stopped at the front door, and again the police rushed into the house, out at the back door, dragged the corpse off the manure heap, through the house, and flung it on top of the real volunteer officer in the back of the car. After telling the Hegartys that they would throw the body into the lake, the police drove off at a furious rate in the direction of Ballybor. On returning to barracks, Jones at once rushed off to have a hot bath, while Blake went to his office to find his two clerks snowed up with paper, correspondence which had arrived by the goods mail while they had been out. After they had some food, Jones was all for raiding the rector of Clunala at once, but Blake made the fatal mistake of attending to the correspondence then, and putting off the raid to the following night. The next night they set out with a strong force of police for the Clunala rectory, but found, though there were evident signs that their information had been correct, that the arms had been removed. The rector was most indignant, and they returned defeated. A few nights afterwards, when at dinner, Blake showed Jones the following paragraph in an Irish paper. A brutal murder. On the night of the third instant, about midnight, armed men in uniform, some of them wearing trench coats, raided the house of Mr. Patrick Hegarty, a respectable farmer, who has never been known to take any active part in politics. Inside, these men found a young man alleged to have been wearing the uniform of an officer in the IRA. This unfortunate young man, without trial of any kind, was at once dragged outside the house, riddled with bullets, and his body thrown on a manure heap in a most callous and brutal manner. After brutally ill-treating Mr. Hegarty and his family, the murderers left to return again, saying that they would take the body away and throw it into the lake. Though the lake has been carefully dragged, no sign of this unhappy youth's body has yet been found. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Seal Island 
Sergeant O'Brien was as fine a type of the R.I.C. as you would meet in half a dozen baronies, of magnificent physique, great courage, full of tact, and with the perfect manners of a true Irishman. At the end of 1918, O'Brien found himself sergeant in charge of Clolay Barracks, a comfortable thatched house close to the shores of Loch Moira and distant about four miles from Ballybor. While at Clolay, his principal work consisted of trying to put down the making of poteen, which was carried on extensively by the inhabitants of two small islands in the south end of the lake. Otherwise, the sergeant was on the best of terms with all the people of the district, who often appealed to him for advice and help, and as O'Brien was a keen fisherman, he often managed to combine business with sport while out in the police boat. Soon after Blake became D.I. at Ballybor, orders were received from the county inspector to evacuate Clowley Barracks and for O'Brien and his men to proceed to Ballybor Barracks. As the country round Clowley had as yet shown no hostility towards the police, and as it was hard to get a house in any town, O'Brien asked and obtained leave for his young wife and family to remain on at Clowley Barracks, and here, not long after the sergeant had gone, the youngest O'Brien was born. Two days afterwards, on a wet winter's evening, there came a knock at the barracks door, and when Mrs. O'Brien asked who was there, a man's voice bade her open in the name of the IRA. Obeying, she found two masked men who covered her with revolvers, and told her they would give her five minutes to clear out of the barracks before they set it on fire. Mrs. O'Brien had seven children, the eldest about ten years, and the youngest two days old, most of whom were in bed by this time. As fast as she could, she roused and dressed the children, but the five minutes soon passed, and the men entered and bundled the whole family, some of the children only half clothed, out into the wet and cold of a winter's night. Outside, Mrs. O'Brien found a large party of Ballybor shop boys, some of them wearing black masks, led by four strange gunmen. This party had arrived at Clolay about an hour before, and had at once proceeded to picket all roads leading to and from the barracks and every unfortunate countryman or woman they met making their way along the roads was at once seized by the pickets taken to the barrack yard and there placed faced inwards against the wall with their hands on top of their heads as soon as the o'brien family had been hustled into the road the gunman threw paraffin and petrol on the thatch of the barracks set it alight and in a very short time the building was a charred ruin they then mounted their bicycles and rode off into the night leaving the unfortunate O'Briens to shift for themselves. Leaving her family huddled under a hedge, the mother tried to get into two neighboring houses, but the blighting curse of the IRA was on her and hers, and not a house would even open its door, let alone take them in. In the end, she saw that it was hopeless, and returning to her children, did her best to keep them warm with her own body and the few blankets she had managed to bring out of the barracks and here they spent the night like the beasts of the field. Next morning, some countrymen, braver than the rest, brought word to the Ballybor barracks of the burning at Clolay, and Sergeant O'Brien arrived on the scene to find his wife and family perished and starving. Such is the mercy of the IRA for the little children of the IRC. O'Brien took his family back to Ballybor barracks, where they were fed and warmed, but in Ireland nowadays a police barracks is no place for little children and women, and before night they must leave. In vain the sergeant tried to find lodgings. He might as well have tried to swim the Atlantic. Every door was slammed in his face directly he made his appeal. But the Good Samaritan is not yet extinct in Ireland, and at last the sergeant found a refuge for his family in the empty gardener's lodge of Ballybor House. While being turned out of Clowley Barracks, Mrs. O'Brien had recognized two of the incendiaries who had taken their masks off as two prominent Sinn Féin shop boys of Ballybor, afterwards telling her husband their names, Martin Walsh and Peter Lynch, and the sergeant never forgot them. On a glorious June day, Blake was leaning over the parapet of the lower bridge crossing the Owenmore River in Ballybor, watching the fishermen hauling in a net full of silvery grills, and wishing that he could accept an invitation to fish at Ardcumber. After a time, his eye wandered to a fleet of boats below the bridge, some anchored while others were attached to mooring buoys. From force of habit he started to count them, and on finding that there were no less than thirty-seven, 
he began to make out their total carrying capacity, which roughly came to the high figure of 300. On the following Sunday he happened to be crossing the same bridge at about 10 in the morning and stopped to look at three boats, packed with young men, a few carrying fishing rods, starting off down the river. The fishing rods were there right enough, but something seemed wrong. The men looked too purposeful, and moreover, eight or nine young men in a boat with a couple of rods is an unusual sight. Blake watched the boats disappearing fast down the river and wondered what would be the right word to substitute for fishing. After a while he realized that there was not a boat left on the river, and further that if all the boats had carried as many passengers as the three he had just seen start, over three hundred young men from Ballybor had gone a-fishing that Sunday morning, the majority of whom, if not all of them, were shop boys, the most dangerous element in the town. The barracks commanded a good view of the reach of the river where the boats were usually moored, and next Sunday at an early hour Blake told off Sergeant O'Brien with a pair of field glasses to report how many boats and how many men went out a-fishing. At eleven o'clock the sergeant reported that, as usual, all the thirty-seven boats had started, carrying two hundred and fifty young men, and that among them he had recognized most of the prominent Sinn Féin shop-boys of the town, but he did not add that he had seen Walsh and Lynch. Five miles below Ballybor, the Owenmore River, from being roughly two hundred yards wide, suddenly becomes an inland sea, with a width of over three miles and a length of a mile. Between this inland water and the open sea runs a long, narrow range of sand hills, commonly known as Seal Island, nearly three miles long and with an average width of four hundred yards. Blake came to the conclusion that the fishing expeditions every Sunday must be connected with this lonely island, but except for drilling, and sand dunes did not seem a suitable place for a parade, he could think of nothing to which this island would lend itself moreover he knew that if he tried to find out what was going on by observing from the mainland he would be spotted and the alarm given and that if he tried to approach the island in a boat from the seaside the fisherman from dunkara would give him away in the end it was settled to wait until the following sunday when sergeant o'brien made his way across country before daylight and hid himself in the tower of an old abbey on the shore of the island sea from which the greater part of seal island was visible on the Sunday night he returned to barracks and reported that the uh, fishermen had all landed at the little pier on the south side of the island, left a small guard over the boats, and made their way into the sand hills, where they were hidden from his view. Some time afterwards muffled intermittent rifle fire started, and continued at intervals for several hours, after which the uh, fishermen returned to their boats and rowed back leisurely to Ballybor on the flood tide. But before Blake could tackle the mystery of Seal Island, he had to turn his attention to a flying column of the IRA which was reported to be making its way towards Ballybor. On the Sunday evening when O'Brien returned from the old abbey, word was brought in by a loyalist that the flying column had been seen that day at the Ballyrick Mountains and had taken up its quarters in the empty house of Mr. Padrego Flaherty member of Dial Ironing for the Ballybor country, who had been for some time past an unwilling guest of the British government somewhere in England. Padre O'Flaherty's house was, advisedly was, situated in the middle of a desolate valley in the mountains twenty miles from Ballyrick and the same distance from Ballybor, and could only be approached by a bog road which winds through mountains and moors without passing a single human habitation for the last eight miles. Moreover, there was not a tree within fifteen miles of the house, so that any attempt at surprise or even attack during the daytime was out of the question. At the first sight of a Crosley, and they had a three-mile view of the road both ways from the house, the flying column would simply dissolve into the mountains, probably to reappear the next day, attacking a police barracks fifty miles the other side of Ballybor. A good example of the kind of problem the RIC has to solve daily in the wild parts of the West. That night Blake left Ballybor with an advanced guard of police on bicycles, and making a detour of the town, timed himself to arrive at O'Flaherty's house just before daylight, having arranged that Jones should follow in the Crosleys with his platoon of Blankshires and as many police as could be spared. 
Arriving too soon, they hid their bicycles in some high heather near the road, and as soon as it was light enough took up positions at different points round the house, so that every avenue of escape would be swept by their rifle fire and waited for the main body to arrive. As the sky became light, smoke could be seen rising from some of the chimneys, a suspicious sign at that hour of the morning, and shortly afterwards four young men appeared at the door, yawning and stretching themselves. After examining the valley in every direction with field glasses, they proceeded to bring about forty bicycles out of a stable and park them in a military formation outside, after which they re-entered the house during the next hour nothing happened and just as blake had given up all hope of the main body arriving and was thinking of trying to rush the house with his small force a large party of men started to leave the house and make for the bicycles and blake was forced to give the order to open fire several men were seen to drop at once while the rest rushed back into the house carrying their wounded with them and in a minute heavy fire was opened from every window in the house on the police positions the firing of a single shot by a policeman being the signal for a hail of bullets in that direction blake was now getting very anxious at the non-arrival of jones's party fearing that instead of capturing the flying column the volunteers might capture the police and in order to deceive them ordered his men to withhold their fire unless the volunteers tried to rush them at last jones turned up having been delayed repeatedly by punctures and completed a strong cordon around the house blake now attempted to draw the cordon closer but every time the police and soldiers tried to advance by short rushes under heavy covering fire the volunteers opened such accurate fire from every window including machine-gun fire from one of the upper rooms that he had to desist eventually the soldiers silenced the machine-gun with their lewis guns after getting to within three hundred yards of the house blake found that owing to the formation of the ground it would be impossible to advance any nearer without heavy losses and refused to allow jones to make an assault with his men until all other means of reducing the place had failed the day was now wearing on and for several hours the situation had remained a complete deadlock the volunteers were obviously marking time until darkness set in when they would stand a good chance of slipping through the cordon and blake fully realized that if he did not win during daylight he would surely lose in the dark blake and jones lay in the heather close together arguing as to whether they should try to assault the house or not jones was keen to try while blake feared a failure with heavy losses the day was by now blazing hot with a steady south wind and jones after lighting a cigarette carelessly threw the match away alight and in a second the dry heather took fire and was only extinguished with great difficulty but the fire had given blake the idea he had been hunting for so long collecting all the matches that the men possessed jones made his way round to the south side of the house and distributed them amongst all the men there who at a given signal set fire to the heather in front of them and as soon as the house was enveloped in a cloud of smoke the whole force charged for the house as soon as they got within range the police hurled mills bombs through every window and the soldiers then dashed in with fixed bayonets but the bombs had done the work they found that the volunteers had suffered heavily hardly a man escaping a bomb splinter or a lewis gun bullet and the question was how to remove so many wounded in the house they found bed and bedding for fully forty men and a great supply of fresh and tinned food also rifles chiefly mauser american shotguns automatics revolvers a quantity of ammunition and a good stock of homemade bombs in a kind of cellar not having enough transport blake sent off a fast car to ask for help from the county inspector before leaving blake blew up mr padrick o'flaherty's house with the volunteers bombs and the party returned to ballybor before dark victorious but worn out as soon as they had had some sleep blake and jones started to work out their plans for a surprise attack on seal island the following sunday and found that they had a difficult task before them except at the east and west ends of the island where the two channels of the river cut through the ridge of sand hills all approaches were visible for a long distance and any idea of surprise out of the question 
On the other hand, if an attempt was made to cross the channels, the Volunteers would have ample time to reach their boats at the pier in the middle of the south shore and so escape, while at a low tide it was possible to walk across at one point to the mainland. In the end, they gave it up and went to consult the C.I., who decided to call in the assistance of the Navy. On Sunday morning, Sergeant O'Brien duly reported that the boats had gone down the river, as usual, with full crews. The previous night, a destroyer had crept into the bay with all lights covered, and after landing a large party of blue jackets on Seal Island, had left again. After allowing sufficient time for the volunteers to land and get to work, Blake followed in a commandeered motor launch, and at the same time Jones left the barracks with his platoon in two Crosleys, each with a Lewis gun, one party making for the western mouth of the river, and the other for the eastern, where they proceeded to take up positions, covering all escape across the channels. About three hundred yards from the pier on Seal Island, Blake and his men landed on a small round green island called Gannet Island, and took up positions covering the boats lying alongside the pier. Directly they landed, a small group of men were seen to leave the pier and disappear into the sand dunes. Meanwhile, the launch, with a machine gun mounted in the bows, proceeded to patrol along the south shore of the island over the shallow water. After a short time, heavy firing broke out in the sand hills and then died down to break out again as a large body of volunteers streamed towards the pier. But before they could reach their boats, Blake's men on Gannet Island opened fire on them and the launch sprayed them well with its machine gun. The volunteers seemed nonplussed and at a loss what to do, but the Blue Jackets, advancing in open order with fixed bayonets from the sand hills, quickly decided them, and they made for the east end of the island, disappearing into a hollow followed by the Blue Jackets. Again heavy firing broke out from the direction of the hollow and continued at intervals for over an hour. Fearing that something was wrong, Blake then embarked his men on the launch, and after landing at the pier, proceeded in the direction of the firing to find the volunteers holding a large house which so far the sailors had failed to take. The house came as a surprise to the police, none of whom had ever set foot on the island before, and there seemed every prospect of another deadlock. The house was old, well built, and commanded a fine field of fire in every direction. But sailors are handy men, and after a consultation with Blake, the lieutenant in command decided to signal to his destroyer, which had anchored in the bay again, to open fire with her guns on the house. After trying in vain to get a direct view of the house, the destroyer opened indirect fire, a sailor on a high sand hill signaling the result of each shot. Unfortunately, the house was so sheltered by the sides of the hollow that nothing short of a howitzer could have reached it but the sailors were not beaten. After putting farther out to sea, the destroyer tried again, and this time, at the third shot, got home with a direct hit, and in a few minutes it was seen that the house was on fire. Sailors and police now held their fire and waited for the exciting moment when the volunteers would be forced by the flames to bolt. A quarter of an hour, half an hour, passed, but not a volunteer bolted from the now fiercely burning house. At last the roof fell in with a crash and a shower of sparks, and every man gripped his rifle, thinking that at last the rebels would be smoked out. But nothing happened. They had either vanished into thin air or were roasted alive. Still the sailors and police waited on, thinking that in the end somebody must come out. Without any warning, one gable end of the house suddenly fell outwards, and simultaneously firing broke out from the east channel of the river, about five hundred yards away. The spell was now broken, and every man dashed in the direction of the firing. When they reached high ground, they could see many of the volunteers swimming across the channel, while those who could not swim were running towards the north side of the island. The half-platoon of the Blankshires, with Sergeant O'Brien as a guide, had taken up their position in the sand hills on the mainland commanding the passage across the east channel and had only been interested spectators of sorts of the battle up to the time the gable fell when to their astonishment they suddenly saw the volunteers streaming out of the sand hills and dashing into the river in front of them foremost among the swimmers sergeant o'brien saw to his great joy the heads of walsh and lynch 
their foot-long hair floating like manes behind them, and knew that his enemies had been delivered into his hands. By the time the swimmers reached the mainland and found themselves covered by the rifles and Lewis gun of the soldiers, they had had enough, and put up their hands of their own accord. The sailors and police now beat the island towards the west end, and after a hard scramble over the sand hills, captured the remaining volunteers. A careful search of the place where the volunteers had suddenly appeared out of the ground showed that there was an underground passage running from the house to within a short distance of the shore, probably used in former days for smuggling purposes. A further search explained the reason of the volunteers' Sunday visits to the island. In a valley of the sand hills they found an up-to-date rifle range and afterwards learnt that it had been built during the early part of the war and frequently used for firing musketry courses by units of the new armies training in Ireland. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 A Family Affair. The Mac Nessa, Prince of Murisk, claimed descent from one of the nine hostages, and though proud of his lineage, he was still prouder of the boast that up to comparatively recent times not one of his ancestors had died in his bed a violent death in some form or other, chiefly the Midoge, accounting for one and all. Murisk Abbey is a modern house, as old places go in Ireland, but in the grounds there are the ruins of a very old castle, built in the days when the O'Fogarty's ruled a countryside as far as horse could gallop in any direction during the hours of daylight. Here the Macnessa had spent most of his life hunting, shooting, fishing, and farming, and incidentally bringing up a family of two sons and four daughters. Both the sons, Cormac and Dominic, had served during the war in the British Army, Dominic willingly and eagerly, and Cormac, the elder, only because he feared his father, who was a staunch loyalist. The spring of 1919 found the two brothers at home, Cormac for good and all as he believed, and Dominic until he could decide how and where to make a living. In England there is nowadays a large class whose one and only object in life appears to be to take sides with any and every enemy of their country, be he Boer, Bosch, Bolshevik, or Sinn Feiner. This party never ceases to aid and abet these enemies by every means in their power, short of endangering their own skins, and at the same time never let an opportunity pass of accusing our soldiers and police in Ireland of every abominable crime which man has been known to commit. During the war this class of Englishmen greatly puzzled and irritated the French, as they have every nation that has ever admired the British as a race. A French interpreter once said to a British officer, Many of your race are noble, the rest are swine. In Ireland, by some lucky chance, we have escaped this detestable and despicable breed of man, to whom a sincere rebel is infinitely preferable, but at the same time we have a class of men and women who are first cousins to them. In many good Irish families, noted for generations past for their unswerving loyalty, there is often one member who is an out-and-out -out rebel. Luckily, he or she has generally less brains than the rest of the family, and is looked upon as a harmless lunatic, and one of the crosses which have to be borne in the world. A plausible reason often advanced for this sporadic appearance of a rebel in a loyal family is the complete lack of conversation at the dinner table once sport has been exhausted when all members of a family see eye to eye in politics, and as a mutual admiration society quickly palls on many young men and women, one member expresses contrary political opinions to the others out of pure cussedness, and the anger and recriminations of the rest quickly turn the bored gibber into a red-hot rebel. Not many weeks after the brothers had returned home from the war, Cormac, who had spent many hours of his youth reading books and pamphlets on the wrongs England had inflicted on Ireland instead of hunting and shooting, and had even appeared at breakfast once in a weird ginger-colored kilt, raised the red flag of Sinn Féin one evening at the dinner table. Probably he did it from sheer boredom, hoping to draw his father into a wordy argument, and so pass the time. 
The result, however, had a far-reaching effect on the lives of both Cormac and Dominic. The mac Nessa was a big man, and Cormac was not, and but for the intervention of Dominic, the elder son would probably have had an unpleasant and painful eviction from the dinner table. However, the old chieftain controlled himself with a great effort, but as soon as the servants had withdrawn, he ordered Cormac to leave the house the following morning for good and all, and in a sullen rage Cormac stalked out of the room. Leaving word with the butler to pack his kit, Cormac made his way to the house of the parish priest, about two and a half miles from the abbey, where, being a Roman Catholic, he hoped to receive sympathy. If there is one church in the world which might be expected to range itself wholeheartedly on the side of law and order, it is the Church of Rome, whose very existence depends on obedience, and it must have been a source of wonder to many English people why, at the very beginning of the Sinn Féin movement, this church did not at once come into the open and denounce Sinn Féin from the altar in plain and unmistakable terms any thinking priest must know that under a semi-bolshevik republic the power of the roman catholic church would be gone and gone forever cormac found the old priest kind and gentle as ever but firm in his refusal to listen to any sinn fein views and in a fresh rage he left to make his way to the curate's lodging in a neighbouring farmhouse and here he was received with open arms the curate quickly perceived what a valuable recruit Cormac might make, and before he left to spend his last night at the abbey, took advantage of the boy's excited mood to make him swear to join the IRA. After a very early breakfast, Cormac left his home on the fifteen-mile drive to Ballybor, where he caught the mail train for Dublin, his heart full of hatred of his family and his mind set on revenge. A week of dirty Dublin lodgings convinced Cormac that he had made a fool of himself, and putting his pride in his pocket, he wrote to his father asking to be allowed to return home. By return of post came a typewritten postcard from the Mac Nessa to the effect that while he lived, no rebel should ever darken his door. That evening two strangers called at his rooms, and after making certain of his identity, explained that a message had been received at the Sinn Féin headquarters in Dublin from Father Michael of Murisk that Cormac was prepared to join in the Sinn Féin movement and offering him a high-sounding position. Cormac's vanity was flattered, and he accepted at once. Knowing that Cormac's name would carry great weight with many half-hearted supporters and waverers, the Sinn Féin leaders employed him solely on propaganda work, sending him to every part of the country, not excepting the North, to speak at meetings, and always taking good care that his name appeared in large letters on the posters, and kind friends were not wanting to send the Mac Nessa cuttings of his son's speeches from every Irish and English paper in which they appeared. During his travels, Cormac at different times met in trains and hotels many friends of his own class, who one and all, to their great credit, refused to speak to him, and this treatment embittered him still more against all loyalists, more especially against his father and brother. After one trip to a town in the south, where he had tried to enter a club and had been ejected by the hall porter, he offered himself on his return to Dublin for active service, and was at once sent to the Ballybor district to organize outrages, the Sinn Féin leaders knowing that the name of O'Fogarty was one to conjure with in that country, even in these days. In the meantime, Dominic had been asked by the authorities to join in the newly formed Auxiliary Division of the RIC in order that his knowledge of the Ballybor country might be utilized, and after a short training in Dublin, found himself quartered in Ballybor with a platoon of cadets. By a coincidence, the two brothers arrived in Ballybor within a week of each other, Cormac an avowed Sinn Féiner, and Dominic an officer in the auxiliaries, who were about to take on the rebels at their own breed of warfare. Every kind of news travels fast in country districts in Ireland, and within twelve hours of the brothers' arrival it was doubtful if you could have found, even in the mountains of Ballyrick, a child who did not know of the O'Fogarty's return. Moreover, there is nothing an Irishman loves more than a fight, and one between two brothers of the best-known family in three counties, with armed men at their back, was something worth looking forward to, even in these days of murder and outrage. 
and at local race meetings in the West, bets were freely taken on the issue of the fight between Cormac and Dominic O'Fogarty. All thought of king or republic was now completely forgotten in Ballybor, and for many miles around the countryside was divided into two camps. Most of the volunteers, all nominally, were for Cormac, whilst all loyalists and a good many volunteers secretly supported Dominic, with the result that so keen were both sides to outmaneuver each other, the police obtained far more information than they had for a long time past. Dominic made up his mind to take the offensive straight away, and learning from one of his volunteer sympathizers that his brother, when in Ballybor, always slept in the house of a man called Ryan, made arrangements to raid the place, and at any rate to put Cormac out of action for some time to come. However, Cormac, learning of his brother's kindly intention, thought that it would be an excellent opportunity to raid Murrisk for arms on that particular night, and incidentally to get some of his own back from his father. Leaving Ballybor as soon as it was dark with a dozen men, they bicycled to Murrisk, and after parking their machines in a wood near the main road, proceeded to knock up the house. The butler opened the door, but did not recognize Cormac in a mask, though his walk seemed vaguely familiar to him. The Macnessa was no coward, and on entering the inner hall, the raiders found themselves covered by the old man with a double-barreled shotgun. Cormac had expected that his father would show fight, and knowing where the electric light switch was in the hall, had arranged with his men that when he turned the light off, they should throw themselves flat on the floor. As the light went out, the Macnessa fired both barrels, which went harmlessly over the raiders' heads, and before he could reload, they had him down and tied up. Cormac then turned on the light, and by now, half mad with rage and excitement, would have gone for his father. But his men kept him back, and when they had secured all the arms in the house under Cormac's directions, they hustled him away. In the meantime, Dominic, with a party of cadets, had raided Ryan's house, but of course drew blank. Early the next morning a mounted messenger brought word to the barracks at Ballybor that Cormac and a party of armed and masked men had raided Murrisk during the night and removed all arms and ammunition. That afternoon Dominic put up large notices all over Ballybor to the effect that if he caught Cormac in the town he would horsewhip him in the marketplace. Both the town and countryside were in a wild state of excitement after the Murrisk raid, Cormac's supporters acclaiming his victory, while Dominic's could only reply, wait and see. And so keen were Dominic's party to help their man that information of every possible kind and description literally poured into the barracks by every post. Like children, as ever, the people quickly forgot that they were either loyalists or rebels, the blood feud between the two brothers being far more interesting and exciting, and it is probable that if only sufficient arms had been forthcoming on both sides, the brothers' feud would have developed into a pitched battle, and if the police had interfered, both parties would then have joined forces and turned on the common enemy. After leaving Murisk, Cormac, knowing that Ballybor would now be too hot for him, made for some caves in the Slevenamo Mountains in the east of the town, and here he remained. Some time before, these caves had been fitted up like dugouts in France, while the food supply gave no difficulty, every house at the foot of the mountains having to supply rations on requisition for any gunman using these caves. Here Cormac had plenty of time on his hands, and thought out a clever plan to put Dominic out of action. Shortly before Cormac raided Murisk, a new and simple manager had arrived at one of the Ballybor banks. The arrival of a new bank manager in an Irish provincial town is always the signal for all in financial difficulties to get busy and try their luck with the fresh arrival, and among the new manager's first visitors came the urban council, who by sheer bluff managed to get their already big overdraft increased by some thousand pounds. A fresh election being within sight, they then proceeded to borrow a derelict steamroller from the county council, who had practically ceased to function, and to spend the money steamrolling the streets of Ballybor. In this way they hoped to catch the votes of the laborers by the payment of high wages, and of the shopkeepers and owners of cars by improved streets. Being in a great hurry to get on with the good work, 
they forgot that the streets had never been steamrolled before and that the gas and water pipes were very near the surface with the result that for every yard of street the roller passed over one or more gas or water pipes burst and the town soon smelt like the inside of a gas works the consequent proceedings give a very fair idea of the Celtic capacity for public affairs, and of how the country would be run under home rule, or any other kind of rule except the Union. Instead of stopping the steam rolling until all mains and pipes had been relayed at a sufficient depth to resist the rolling, they solemnly proceeded to roll, burst, and mend from one end of the main street to the other, to the huge delight of all the local plumbers, who also had votes. Luckily, the money was exhausted by the time the main street was finished, and though the greater part of the surface was excellent, the ridges made by digging up the pipes at intervals would break the axle of an unsuspecting stranger's car, to the great benefit of the local garages. The police barracks at Ballybor are situated in a cul-de-sac off the main street, at the corners of which stand the principal hotel and a bank and all cars going to or from the barracks must pass this corner. Word was brought to Cormac in his mountain dugout that his brother left Ballybor Barracks early every morning with a Crosley full of cadets, and that they spent the whole day, and often most of the night, searching the surrounding country for him. Before leaving Ballybor he had witnessed the steamrolling comic opera, and bicycling by night to Ballybor he lay up during the day, got in touch with a plumber, borrowed his tools and barrow, and late that afternoon, in the plumber's clothes and slouch hat pulled well over his face, started to dig up the road between the bank and the hotel. Human nature always seems to regard the digging up of a street in the light of a huge joke, and during his work Cormac was not only chaffed by the bank manager and the hotel loafers, but by the police themselves. When it was dusk, he was joined by a volunteer with a charge of galignite, which had been raided from a government ship off the southeast coast and brought to the west by car, and the two proceeded to lay a contact mine in the center of the road. They then filled in the earth, returned the tools and barrow to the plumber, and bicycled back to the mountains. While Cormac was busy laying his mine, Dominic and Blake were poring over an ordnance map in the barracks not sixty yards away. Having come to the conclusion that it was quite useless to search the countryside piecemeal, and hearing a rumor of what was going on in the mountains through one of the forced food contractors having made a bitter complaint to a passing police patrol, they were now planning to surround the southern half of the Slevenamo Mountains and organizing a great drive and the next two days were spent working out the details. About 9 a.m. a mineral water lorry, in order to turn, backed up the cul-de-sac, and the mine being well and truly laid, disappeared in a sheet of flame, wrecking the bank and hotel. Hardly had the sound of the explosion died away, and before the police left the barracks to investigate, every young man in Ballybor of the shopkeeper class had his bicycle out and was off as hard as he could pedal. A volunteer greatly resembles a mountain hare. Directly the hunt is up, he makes at top speed for high ground, and the harder you press both, the faster they leg it up the mountains. Blake and Dominic managed to control their men, and no reprisals followed, the only arrest being the unfortunate plumber who had lent his outfit to Cormac and whose bicycle had been uh, borrowed by an agitated shop boy. At the present time, a big drive in the West presents great difficulties. Very few, often none, of the RIC or auxiliaries know anything of the many wild and mountainous parts in their districts, and the soldiers are invariably complete strangers. To reconnoiter the ground beforehand is out of the question, and it is difficult to induce reliable guides to act. The part of the mountains Blake and Dominic had selected to drive lay about nine miles due east of Ballybor, divided by a deep pass from the remainder of the range to the north, and ending in a wild rocky valley intersected by the Owenmore River to the south, and the total area to be covered was about eighteen square miles of mountains, glens, cliffs, and bogs. It was not possible to start operations before 3 a.m., the month being August, and they would have to stop soon after 11 p.m., summertime, which gave them roughly 20 hours to beat the 18 square miles. 
Taking the total number of troops at their disposal, Blake divided them into groups of six, giving them nearly a hundred groups. Then Dominic picked out from a contoured ordnance map the same number of points surrounding the mountains, from all of which there was a good view and field of fire, and it was arranged that as many groups as possible should have either a Vickers machine gun or a Lewis gun. The actual drive was to be carried out by the police. The cadets under Dominic were to start from the north end in a crescent formation and advance towards the highest point, which lay nearly in the center of the area, while the RIC under Blake were to advance from the south. Dominic knew every yard of the mountains, having shot grouse there with his brother since boyhood, but the difficulty was to procure a guide for Blake's party, none of whom had ever set foot on the mountains. With much persuasion, however, Dominic at last induced a man, who had been one of the MacNess's game watchers on the mountains for years, to act as guide. This man had to be promised a large sum of money, and to save him from the revenge of Sinn Féin, it was arranged that directly after the drive he should be safely got away to enlist in the British Army under an assumed name, and if he wished, to be sent straight off to India. All officers and NCOs were given maps showing the position of every group marked, and it was arranged that the police should be in position at 3 a.m. and the troops half an hour later. A few days before the date fixed for the drive, Dominic and his auxiliaries disappeared from Ballybor, and it was given out that they had gone to County Cork. Sharp at 3 a.m. on a perfect August day, the drive began. Dominic and the cadets had to start from the shores of a large lake lying in a cup at the top of the pass and climb a thousand feet before reaching the first valley in the mountains. At the top they halted for a breather and to admire the wonderful view. To the east the summer sun was fast rising, all around them stretched miles of heather-clad hills, and away to the northwest lay the sea, a pearly gray-blue in the fast-growing light. After a rest, Dominic got his men into formation, spreading them out as far as possible without losing touch, while he kept a small party in the rear to go to any threatened point where the gunmen might try to break through the cordon. The cadets had brought their signalers with them, equipped with a heliograph and flags, who remained with the reserve party. On reaching higher ground, Dominic could see with his glasses the small groups of soldiers taking up their positions, while far away in the plain to the eastward the Owenmore River wound like a blue thread through the dark bogland. A cadet on his left nearly walked on a pack of grouse, which swung right-handed, passing within twenty yards of Dominic and reminding him vividly of other days. Very soon the cadets began to feel the heat of the sun, and the hard going began to tell on several of them. Sitting in a Crosley is bad training for walking a grouse mountain. After going about a mile and a half, a party of men were seen in front, making eastward at full speed down a valley, the end of which Dominic knew was held by a group of soldiers with a machine gun. Halting his men, he then brought his right wing well around so as to cut off the gunmen's retreat to the west should they attempt to break back. The fleeing gunmen were soon lost sight of in dead ground, but presently the sound of firing was heard from the far end of the valley, and after a time the gunmen were seen retreating across the cadet's front and making as hard as they could for the west side of the mountains. At this point, Blake's men came in sight from the south, and quickly getting in touch with the cadet's right wing, completed the cordon. The gunmen, seeing that they were surrounded and all retreat cut off, split up into two parties, took up positions on two kopjes, and waited for the attack. As a frontal attack would have entailed heavy loss, and seeing that there was another kopje on Blake's side which would command and enfilade the gunmen's positions, Dominic ordered the cadets to pin the gunmen down by their fire, and at the same time sent a signaler to Blake telling him to occupy the commanding kopje. This Blake did, and also sent to the nearest group of soldiers for a machine gun. The fight lasted for two hours, and though the gunmen were always subject to a hot fire, several times a man was seen to spring into the air and collapse in the heather. Yet they stuck it gamely until the machine gun was brought up and opened a heavy fire on both kopjes. The remaining gunmen then stood up and put up their hands. 
On the two Kopjes, the police found 12 dead gunmen and 28 prisoners, 18 of whom were wounded, and amongst the dead, Dominic found Cormac, shot through the heart. After arranging for the burial of the dead, with the exception of Cormac, who was carried down the mountainside on a stretcher, and the removal of the prisoners, Dominic took a party of cadets to search some caves which he knew of about half a mile to the southwest. Here, as he expected, he found that the gunmen had been living in comparative comfort. One cave had been used as a living room and contained chairs and tables, while two smaller inner ones were fitted up with bunks in tiers like a Bosch dugout and had heather for bedding. Towards evening the worn-out cadets got back to their Crosleys on the pass road, which ran along the north shore of the lake, and after leaving a party with a searchlight mounted on a tender to stop any stray gunmen escaping during the night on bicycles by the road to the east, Dominic started for Muresk and a Crosley with his brother's body. Many an evening the two brothers had driven home together over the same road after a happy day's grouse shooting, never dreaming that their last journey together would be to bring Cormac's body to the home of their ancestors. The Magnessa met the party in the great hall of Murrisk, and his ancestors, looking down from the walls, must surely have thought that they were back again in their own times of everlasting war and sudden death. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of Tales of the Royal Irish Constabulary by Unknown. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen: The American Nurse. In the early eighties, there lived in the Clunalla district a small farmer named Peter Walsh, who was what is generally called in the West a bad farmer, which is simply the Irish way of saying that he was lazy and good for nothing and for several years Walsh had been in the clutches of the Clunala Gombeen man, the local big shopkeeper. The ways of the Gombeen man are quite simple and usually most successful, the success largely depending on a run of bad potato crops, as generally after two successive failures the majority of the farmers in a poor mountainous district have no money at all. They are thus forced to go to the Gombeen Walla, who advances them so much money, according to the size of their farm and their capacity for drink, as a mortgage on the farm at a high rate of interest. But instead of paying them money he gives credit for goods, and there is a verbal agreement that he will not foreclose as long as the farmer deals solely with him and makes no bones about the prices he is charged. Formerly this was the terrible millstone which used to hang for life round the necks of many western peasants. However, Walsh's millstone troubled him not one bit, and he staggered along for several years until there came a sequence of three bad and indifferent crops which finished him completely. Seeing that Walsh was not going to make any effort, the Gombeen man closed on the farm, and Peter, the wife, and their one child, Bridget, aged three years, left Ireland for America, illogically cursing the British government for their own sins and those of the Gombeen devil. Now the Gombeen man had no use for Peter's farm himself, so he proceeded to make Peter's brother, Michael, drunk one Saturday night in his shop, and made the farm over to him with the former conditions, not forgetting to double the mortgage. In due course Michael died without kith or kin, saving Bridget, now a hospital nurse in New York, who one day received a letter from a Ballybor solicitor informing her of her uncle's death and that she was the sole heiress to his two farms in Clunala and asking for instructions. From her youth upwards, Nurse Bridget had heard nothing but abuse of the so-called English tyranny in Ireland. In fact, up to the time when she went to be trained hospital nurse, her only knowledge of England and Ireland was the thousand and one supposed wrongs which Ireland had suffered at the hands of England since the days of Cromwell, and her one ambition in life was to see the downfall of the British Empire, and with that the freedom of her fatherland. In America the Irish children find plenty of mentors of hate of England, both among their own people and the Germans. In time, when Bridget began to earn some money as a nurse, she joined every Irish anti-British society, secret and otherwise, she could. 
and at the time of her leaving the States to take over her uncle's farms, possessed more wonderful and weird badges and medallions than she could conveniently wear at once. Incidentally, the societies relieved her of most of her earnings to provide powder and shot for old Ireland. On the liner, Bridget met many of her race, mostly men and women who had worked hard for some years in the States, and saved enough money to return to Ireland, where they hoped to buy a small farm or shop and never to wander any more. One and all were longing to be in Ireland once again, and not one ever mentioned a word of the brutal English tyranny until Bridget started the subject. Bridget landed at Queenstown, made her way to Cork, and set out on the long and tedious cross-country railway journey to the west. At the best of times the journey is a slow one, but during 1920 it became much worse, owing to the great uncertainty of any train reaching its destination. Trains were even known to stand in a station for days on end, while the driver, the stoker, the guard, and the station employees argued and re-argued what they would do and what they would not do. Twice during the journey Bridget had glimpses of the brutal British soldiery when two military parties wished to travel on the train, and the driver and guard refused to start until the armed assassins of the British government left. At first Bridget was slightly confused. No doubt the soldiers were terrible blackguards, but at the time they seemed to be quiet and inoffensive, and she remembered frequently having seen American soldiers in the trains in the States, and the drivers and guards there made no objection. However, a fellow passenger explained to her that the soldiers used the Irish railways to go from one part of the country to another in order to murder the unfortunate soldiers of the Republican Army, and that the guard and driver, as became good citizens and soldiers of the Irish Republic, were quite right to refuse to aid and abet the British by carrying them on the train. At a junction some thirty miles from Ballybor, she changed into a composite train carrying passengers and goods, and soon after leaving the junction the train pulled up suddenly in a cutting, and there was loud shouting and firing. Bridget was greatly alarmed and excited, thinking that she would now see the British troops commit some of the terrible crimes she had heard so much about in the States. She had heard nothing of the crimes of the IRA it takes a long time in the west of ireland to do anything and it was quite twenty minutes before bridget realized that this was a hold-up by the ira and that all the passengers were to get out and line up at the top of the cutting the confusion then became terrific half the passengers going up one side of the cutting and the remainder up the other wild-looking masked bandits then started shouting to the people to come down and go to the other side whereupon a general post ensued Finally, the whole lot was collected together, searched, and at last allowed to take their seats in the train again, but the performance was not by any means over yet. Next, the wagons were all broken open, the contents thrown on the line, and then returned, except Belfast merchandise, which was made into a heap. Coffins, cases of jam and tea, boxes of linens and so forth, sprinkled with petrol, and then set on fire. Bridget arrived at Ballybor on a summer's evening, and at once set out for Coonalla. Ballybor appeared a mean and dirty little town to her American eyes, and she hoped for better things at Coonalla, a good hotel and decent stores. After an hour and a half's drive, the carman pulled up outside Coonalla Chapel and asked his fare where she wanted to go to. Not realizing where she was, Bridget replied to Coonalla, the best hotel in Coonalla, only to learn to her astonishment that the place boasted only one shop and no hotel of any kind, and in the end she was thankful to accept the hospitality of a farmer's wife and share a stuffy bed with the woman's daughter. Bridget received a shock when she saw her uncle's house. She said that they wouldn't put a pig in it in America, and the idea she had had of settling down there quickly vanished. However, she determined to stay on a while in Ireland, and help to the best of her ability the famous soldiers of the IRA. She had not realized yet that the bandits who had held up the train were the famous soldiers, of whom she had heard so much in America. On visiting the solicitor in Ballybor, she found that her uncle had left her a few hundred pounds, and this she gave to the man Hanley, with whom she lodged, to buy cattle with, to stock her farm.' 
As soon as Bridget had settled down she found ample scope for her political ambitions both in Cloonalla and Ballybor, where most of the young people of her own age found talking sedition far easier and more amusing than hard work. And as everybody seemed to have money to burn, she had a great time, political meetings, drilling, picnics, and dances. And after joining the Kuman Naban, she volunteered for active service with the local company of the IRA, little knowing what was before her. At first the game was amusing enough, teaching the young men the rudiments of first aid and lecturing to the girls and youths of Kunala in the schoolhouse in the evening, followed by dancing until the early hours of the morning. And probably Bridget would have gone no further than this, but for the unfortunate arrival of two professional gunmen in Kunala, who had been sent from Dublin to carry out the usual series of outrages, and then to vanish before the storm burst. The gunman came with a list of local undesirables, from the IRA point of view, to be removed. Many of the names had probably been given out of private spite through the means of unknown letters, a very favourite practice in Ireland, and at once proceeded to work, or rather to see that the Cunala volunteers did the dirty work. The following week seemed to Bridget like a horrible nightmare, starting with the murder of ex-soldiers who paid the full penalty of being so stupid as to believe that the British government would protect its friends and supporters in Ireland, and culminating in the revolting crime of the murder of a Protestant clergyman who was seventy-nine years of age. Early in the morning, before the household was up, the old man heard a loud knocking at the hall door, and on coming downstairs found the usual party of armed and masked men, who ordered him to follow them. He did so, and had no sooner reached the road than they shot him dead, to be found by his old wife, the servants dared not leave the house, lying in the middle of the road in a pool of blood. That night the gunmen vanished, and with them the orgy of crime ceased for a time, at any rate. There is no doubt that these revolting and apparently purposeless murders are instigated by the IRA, but nevertheless they are carried out by the peasants in most cases, and they will have to bear the stigma now and always. Under a determined leader they appear to take kindly to political murder. Bridget was physically and mentally sick with horror, and made up her mind to return to the States as soon as she could dispose of her farms, and to this end bicycled into Ballybor to arrange with an auctioneer to sell the farms for her by public auction at the earliest possible date. The following day the auctioneer inspected the farms, and declared that she ought to get at least a thousand pounds for her interest in each farm, and fixed a near date for the auction, though he was very doubtful if the IRA would permit it, and advised her to try and obtain their consent. But the last thing in the world Bridget wanted was to have any further dealings with the IRA, and the auctioneer left, promising to do his best. That night, after the Hanleys and Bridget had gone to bed, they received a visit from the captain of the Clunala Volunteers, who wanted to know if it was true that Bridget was going to try and sell her farms by public auction. Bridget told him that it was quite true, and that she was going to return to America. Whereupon he told her that the IRA would not allow this, and that if she wanted to dispose of her land, a Sinn Féin court would value it, and the Republican government would then take it over and pay her in dial iron and bonds, to be redeemed at their face value when Ireland is free and the Republic established, and after telling her to stop the auction, he left. In a few days Bridget received an order to attend the Sinn Féin arbitration court in Clunala Chapel at night, where the judges valued her farms at one hundred pounds each, loud applause in court by the men who hoped to get the farms, and ordered her to hand over the land the following day to the Clunala volunteer captain, who had every intention of keeping the farms himself. Bridget protested loudly that she was a citizen of the United States, that the farms were hers, and that if this was a free country like america she was entitled to get the full market value for them which she had been told was quite two thousand pounds and lastly that she had proved herself a good patriot and burst into tears all of no avail the judges gave her three days to get rid of her cattle and hand over the land at the end of which time if she had not complied she was to be deported and her farms and cattle confiscated
Bridget returned to the Hanley's house to find her boxes packed and dumped in the road, together with her bicycle and the door of the house locked, and this in the middle of the night. After trying in vain to gain admittance, she sat down on one of her boxes and started to cry. Towards dawn, she again made a piteous appeal to the Hanleys to be allowed to stay in their house for the rest of the night, and that she would leave the following day. And for answer, Mrs. Hanley cursed her and warned her that if she was not gone before daylight, her hair would be cut off, and God only knew what else would happen to her. In a blind terror, she mounted her bicycle and rode madly into Ballybor, where she had to wait some hours in the streets before she could gain admittance to a lodging-house. Bridget was made of the right stuff, and with the daylight and the contact with friendly human beings, her courage returned, and she went to see the auctioneer once more, but received cold comfort. The man had been warned not to hold the auction, but was willing to, provided he had police protection, he saw his trade slipping away if he did not, and suggested that she should go and see the D.I. Blake listened patiently to her tale of woe. He already knew the part she had played with the Clunala volunteers, but liked the girl's looks and her pluck, and at the end promised her protection for the auction, but warned her that he could not protect her afterwards, and advised her to get out of the country as soon as she could. Bridget then hired a car and drove out to Clunala to try and collect her belongings. The boxes were still there by the roadside, but empty, and on going on to her farms she found that the fences and gates were smashed and her cattle gone. She tried in vain to get information of them, but found that not a man, woman, or child would tell her anything. Returning to Ballybor, she again saw Blake, who promised to send out police to try and find her cattle. The following day the police went out to Kunala, rounded up the first score of men they met, made them build up the fences, mend the gates, and lastly gave them two hours to return Bridget's cattle. The IRA now turned the full blast of that potent weapon, the boycott, on to the unfortunate Bridget. Not a soul would, or rather dare, speak to her, at any rate in public. Little children meeting her in the streets or country roads ran away, fearing lest she might cast an evil eye on them. Shopkeepers were forbidden to supply any goods to her, and the lodging-house people would have put her out on the streets but for the interference of the D.I. By this time Blake was determined to see her through, and when the auctioneer attempted to rat, made him think better of it and stick to his agreement with Bridget. The day of the auction arrived, and with it the biggest crowd Clunala had ever seen. In fact, so dense was the throng that when Blake drew up with the auctioneer and Bridget, he was afraid to let his men near the crowd, lest they might be rushed. Standing up in a Crosley, he ordered the people through a megaphone to form three sides of a square facing the road, and as soon as they had complied with his order, he told the auctioneer to get out and carry on with his work on the fourth side of the square. This he did, and after describing the value and virtues of the farms in the usual flowery language of his kind, asked for a bid. There followed a deadly silence of fully two minutes. Again the auctioneer called for a bid, and yet a third time. Not a man in the huge crowd dared open his mouth. Land hunger is the predominant trait in a western peasant's character, and many men in that crowd would have risked their souls for Bridget's farms, but so great was the power, or rather the fear, of the IRA, that not a single man dared speak. Seeing that it was useless to go on with the farce, Blake ordered the auctioneer to return to the car. At once the crowd broke with an angry roar and made an ugly rush towards the road, but a volley of blank in the air quickly stopped them, and they turned to scatter in the opposite direction, while the police party returned to Ballybor. That night, when she went to bed in the lodging-house, Bridget locked her door and piled all the furniture she could against it. About 2 a.m. someone knocked loudly at her door and bade her open, but she lay still and gave no answer. She could then hear the raiders entering the other rooms of the house and the screams of inmates followed by the curses of the raiders. The girl lay shaking in bed, knowing that it was only a question of time before they came again, and when they did it gave her almost a sense of relief. 
This time they did not knock, and she could hear whispering followed by a man wearing rubber soles running down the passage, and then a crash as he hurled himself against her door. The door was rotten and gave, but the furniture still held it up, and the other men then put their shoulders against it, and finally it gave way altogether, and the whole lot pitched into her room in a heap on the floor. As Bridget screamed, the men flashed their electric torches onto her, and by the light she could see that they all wore painted white masks, which completely covered their faces except the eyes and mouth. One great brute then seized her by the hair and dragged her screaming down the stairs and into the street where the others held her while the big man shaved her hair off with a razor. They then lashed her wrists and ankles, gagged her, and flung her in her nightdress into a waiting ford, which disappeared into the night. A police patrol, guided by the screams, arrived on the scene just as the ford was disappearing in the direction of Castleport. Sending a constable back to the barracks for a car and more men, the sergeant in charge searched the lodging house only to raise a fresh alarm among the terrified inmates, most of whom were under their beds. In a few minutes the car arrived and the police raced off after the Ford as fast as the Crosley would travel. For some time the police had had a strong suspicion that a creamery about halfway between Ballybor and Castleport had been frequently used by the IRA as a detention prison, and as they drew near the place they saw lights disappear from the windows. After surrounding the building the sergeant knocked at the door and received no answer. Being afraid to delay lest they might be attacked, he told his men to take one of the two thick iron-bound planks carried under the body of the Crosley and used for crossing trenches on the roads and to use it as a battering ram on the door. At the second blow the door splintered and a third made a hole large enough for the police to pass in. The sergeant now advanced into the building, revolver in one hand and torch in the other, and had nearly reached the back when shots and shouts were heard, and at the same time they saw a man disappearing through a door ahead of them and fired. On reaching the door he was met by his own men, who said that three men had tried to escape that way and that they had shot two, the third escaping. They then searched the building and found Bridget lying in a kind of coal cellar, half dead from fright and exposure, and wrapping her in a policeman's greatcoat, took her back to the lodging house, leaving a guard there for the rest of the night. The next day Bridget fled to England to return to America from Southampton. Nothing in this world would have induced her to spend another night in Ireland. She left the sale of her farms in the hands of the auctioneer who, to his great surprise, some time afterwards found a buyer at a low figure in a man who came from the north. The police saw the northerner into his new home and left him there. The following morning the man staggered into the Ballybor barracks, and when he had sufficiently recovered, he told Blake that soon after he had gone to sleep he was awakened by volumes of smoke, and on getting out of bed found that the house was on fire. Seizing his clothes, he just managed to get out before the blazing roof fell in. Outside he was met by a roaring crowd, who beat him nearly to death with sticks, and while he lay on the ground he could hear the screams of his horses and cattle being burnt to death in the blazing outbuildings. The crowd then left him for dead, well pleased with their night's work. After some hours he recovered and managed to crawl into Ballybor. End of chapter 15